Well, good evening to everyone. It is certainly good to be here. And again, we're so thankful for the presence of everyone that is able to be with us. Tonight, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to cover tonight 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, uh, through the end of that chapter, and then, Lord willing, the entirety of chapter 7, which is 16 verses. Now, this is, as you can probably already tell just by looking at it, a fairly lengthy section of Scripture. And there are many things that are found within this. There certainly are probably a few different sermons worth of material in these verses. And I am going to do my best to get through all of these verses tonight. And so what that means is we won't be able to go necessarily each uh, in a detailed way through each and every verse. But we'll group many of these verses together and try and get some of the larger main points from the various passages that are included in this section and uh, there are a couple of very main themes in these passages that we're going to look at that I'd like to probably focus on a little bit more as we go throughout our study tonight. Now, if you recall, and I know it's been a little while since our last 2 Corinthians study, but you might recall that 2 Corinthians is a little bit of a different book, and it's a little bit of a challenging book when it comes to some of the New Testament epistles. It's quite different than many of Paul's other letters that he writes, even quite different than the first letter to the Corinthians that we've already studied through. It's a much more emotional letter. It is an appeal from Paul in many ways to the Corinthians. He is pleading his case before them in a sense. He is pleading with them to call to mind what he has done for them, the sincerity he has shown, the sincerity that has been shown not only to them, but throughout all of his ministry. He's answering perhaps some of the allegations that have been levied against him by some of these false apostles and individuals that were corrupting the Corinthian brethren there. And so it has just a different tenor and a different theme, you might say, than many of Paul's other letters. In fact, that's primarily what he's been doing through the first six chapters, is he has been discussing his ministry. He's been defending the way in which he has preached the gospel. He's been reminding them of why he preaches the gospel and how he preaches the gospel and the things that he has suffered for preaching the gospel And in many ways, this shows them his sincerity and his love. It also shows the difference between him and these false apostles who he's going to put in his target here in a few chapters. But that is coming to an end here at the end of chapter 6 and chapter 7. Paul is essentially concluding that portion of this letter. Very, very lengthy portion, but he's bringing to an end the discussion of his ministry. And so as he does this, there is one major issue Uh, which is kind of a vague issue in some ways, but there's one major thing that Paul needs to address with the brethren. Even the ones that are faithful, the ones that have repented, there is still something that he needs to admonish them for before moving on to some of the other things later on in this chapter. And that's going to be uh, very the focal point, if you will, of part of what we'll look at tonight. Now, the outline for what the, the passages that we'll look at First of all, Paul in the first couple of verses is going to give a plea to the Corinthians to open their heart to him. It's kind of a summation to what he has said so far. He's going to remind them that he has opened his heart. That means that that he has loved them and he has shown his love. He has demonstrated that love uh, to them and he wants them to return that. He wants them to return their love to him. And if they do that, that's not just... I think Paul wants them to love him as he loves them, but that also will mean that they love the things that Paul loves, and that is, of course, going to be the truth and holiness, and that is part of why Paul is calling them to love him also. Of course, he is going to plead for pure relationships, and this is the crux of really this passage, or at least the end of chapter 6. Some commentators even think that this passage doesn't belong here because it would naturally go from verse 13 to chapter 7, verse 2. And so some commentators think that uh, verses 14 or 6, verse 14 through 7, verse 1 somehow were inserted by someone else. But uh, the better commentators do not agree with that. And I don't think that's accurate either, even though it is a very abrupt transition from 6, verse 13 to 6, verse 14, and then another abrupt transition in 7, verse 2. I think this is placed in there for a purpose. Paul is showing his love for them. He's calling them to love him. And then he comes with one of his strongest admonishments to the Corinthians in this section of the letter. And then chapter 7 is going to be primarily about Paul's joy and confidence. After, After 
admonishing them in a very serious and quite severe way. He is going to show how he's already had to admonish them before with the letter, the first letter to the Corinthians, and how he had been confident, uh, even boastful in a way to Titus, that they would hear him and they would listen to him, and he relays how that has been the case. And I think that is to show that in this most recent admonishment, he is still confident that they will do what is right. And so let's go ahead and begin. We're just going to read these, and for time's sake, we're not going to read the whole passage since it's uh, almost or a little over 20-some verses, but we'll read them as we come to them. And in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 11 through 13, Paul says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. When Paul says that he has spoken freely to you, says we have spoken freely to you, what this means is he has spoken plainly. He's spoken directly. In many cases, he has spoken frankly. He has not spoken to them in riddles. He has not beat around the bush, as you might say. When he has something he needs to say, he has said it. He has been very free with the way that he talks with them. And that's where we get this idea of we have spoken freely to you. You know, when you are dealing with someone that you love, someone that you trust, someone that you're close with, you're much freer with the way that you speak to them. You're much more open with the way that you speak to them. Think about a parent with a child, which kind of plays into what Paul says here. A parent is very free with the way that they speak to their children. When one of the boys does something that's wrong, I don't kind of beat around the bush. I don't try and hint at the fact that they might have done something wrong. I'm quite free with what I say to them. I'm pretty direct, sometimes pretty blunt, in getting on to them and letting them know that what they've done is wrong. And that's what Paul is essentially saying. He's saying, we have spoken very plainly. There's no reason for them to misunderstand, uh, but also this is done from love. You know, a parent doesn't speak freely and directly to a child because they dislike them. They speak freely and directly to a child because, one, that's their responsibility as a parent, and two, because they love them, because they want the child to avoid error. Now, in the church, this speaks to the way that we should handle problems in the church. This speaks to when we have a brother or a sister who is sitting. We need to have the types of relationships with one another. We need to have the trust and the respect for one another that when needed, we can speak freely to one another. Now, some people, and we all know people like this, you have to be very careful with everything you say around them, especially if there's something that needs to be rebuked or corrected slightly in their lives. You have to try and hint at it, and you have to try and get them to see it, and you're terrified of speaking freely, of speaking directly. And the truth is, that shouldn't be the case in the Lord's church. When there is sin, we need to be able to address it. Now, the reason that we address sin needs to be right. And Paul has spoken plainly and directly. He has spoken freely to them out of love. He has done this because he says our heart is wide open. Now, there's a few things about this. First of all, it's amazing and impressive that of Paul's, Paul's love for them is impressive. Now, they have done some pretty terrible things. When you look back at what he had to rebuke in 1 Corinthians, they certainly were not the Christians that they ought to be. And yet, Paul loved them. Paul's heart was open wide to them, and he wanted what was best for them. In fact, it is because he loves them that he has rebuked them, and he has spoken so freely to them. Paul did not rebuke them and uh, kind of hammer on them in 1 Corinthians because he wanted to belittle, because he wanted to humiliate, because he was irritated with them. He did so because he loved them. Now, some people, we all have different personalities, and so the way we deal with situations sometimes are different. But it's hard to tell sometimes with certain people when they rebuke sin and when they get onto people, even sometimes when we preach, sometimes it's almost like people kind of enjoy rebuking others. You get the sense from some people that they sure like to talk about how bad other people are and how awful the world is and how terrible everyone is. But that's not the call of the preacher. It's not the call of any Christian. We speak freely. That's true. We speak frankly about sin. But we do so because our heart should be wide open to the souls of others. 
And even when our brothers and our sisters struggle, even when they frustrate us, even when they don't do what we know they should do, even when we don't, they don't do what we know they are capable of doing, when they stumble, when they sin, when they fall, and surely that frustrates us sometimes. But instead of getting angry, instead of giving up, we continue to love them. Now that doesn't mean that we look over their sin. It means we rebuke them. And that's the other thing we see from Paul. Paul uh, Paul's relationship with these brethren is at stake here. There's a rift between Paul and the Corinthians that he's trying to mend. Now as he shows, it's not him that's the cause of the rift. It's their restrictions. It's their sin that is the cause of this rift. But Paul is not willing to overlook their sin simply for the sake of harmony. See, that's the other extreme some people go to. They don't want to cause a rift, and so they just overlook the sin. They overlook a person's speech. They overlook a person's immodesty. They overlook uh, a person skipping the Lord's Day service. They overlook the immorality or whatever it might be. They overlook those things because they don't want to cause a rift in the relationship. For some time back, I was reading a, a debate or a discussion taking place uh, about the, the Lord's Supper between an individual who was arguing for one cup and one loaf and an individual who was arguing for multiple loaves. And the individual that was arguing on behalf of those who use multiple cups and loaves actually stated at one point that he saw the scriptural reason for one cup and one loaf. In fact, he even went so far as to say, I think that's the best way. I wish that that's how we did that, but I know that there are people in my congregation that would refuse that. And I think that harmony and unity is more important in this case. And what that essentially means is he was wanting to overlook a wrong form, a tainted form of worship for the sake of harmony. Well, obviously God has never called us for that. God wants harmony between his people, but he wants us to be in harmony and in unity in his word. And that's exactly what Paul's doing. Paul is not backing down an inch on the ethical purity that the Corinthians must have in their lives. And thus he is speaking frankly to them. And we need to have that same courageous attitude. We need to have that same loving attitude to be willing to rebuke one another and we need to have the attitude that recognizes sometimes we need to be rebuked. And when brethren rebuke us, they are doing so out of love. So Paul wants this relationship mended, but it's the Corinthians that are restricting that relationship. And this whole plea is really done in the form of that of a concerned parent. He says there, I speak as to children. That translation makes it almost sound like he's saying, I speak as to immature people. But I don't think that's what Paul's meaning here. We might understand that as, I speak as to my children. Paul has before already in the Corinthian correspondence shown that he views the Corinthians as his children. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 14 and 15 he said, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ... You do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So like I mentioned, as a parent speaks freely to a child, that's what Paul has done. And again, why does a parent speak so freely to a child? Because they love them and they want what is best for them. And so Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to listen to him, to recognize his love for them, the importance of turning around, and he wants them to return that love. And as parents, we can understand that. Even when we rebuke a child, we want them to see the reason why, especially as they grow older, and we want them to love us. They want them to re we want them to return that love for us, and we want them to join us in our love for the truth. And that is exactly what Paul is looking for. And with that, he makes a very abrupt transition. He has made the case for his ministry. He has reminded them again and again of his love for them. And he has called them to love him and the truth that he has shared. And now the crux of, uh, or a big portion of the crux of this letter, 6 verse 14 through the first part of verse 16, he says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? So now at this point, Paul moves on to one of the most important imperatives of his letter. He, get, he does this by issuing a command. He has pleaded with them to open their hearts also. But now this is a plea 
but also a command. And he backs this command up with five rhetorical questions. The command is, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And then he asks these five questions to help them see why they should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now these questions are meant to help the Corinthians see the purpose of Paul's command. And this is important, especially for those of us that are teachers. Notice that he is dealing with a sensitive issue, as we'll kind of see as we go through this. But Paul doesn't just command and expect blind obedience. Now, when God says something, it should be obeyed. And this is an inspired apostle. But he wants them to see the reason and the logic behind the command. Essentially, he is wanting them to come to the same conclusion that he holds. He wants them to have the fervor to not be unequally yoked as he has that fervor for them. And then after these questions, as we'll see, he's going to refer to Scripture to finalize this argument of why Christians should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now this idea of being unequally yoked, uh, there's a, uh, an allusion to that back in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are some laws, some of which we think are strange and some of which are difficult uh, to wrestle with and determine the exact reason why. But there are some laws in the law of Moses that forbade certain mixing of certain things. You know, a field was not supposed to be sown with two different types of seed. There's that passage that says that a wool and other uh, fabrics are not to be woven into the same garment. Now, some of this has to do with what is set apart uh, for the sacred and for the holy. Uh, and some of them might be, it's hard for us to tell at this point, but it might be something to do with distancing them from some of the idolatrous practices of the land and the nations around them. But there are two laws that are similar to this as far as being yoked together uh, with livestock. In Leviticus 19, verse 19, uh, God said, You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. And so cattle were not supposed to be crossbred with other types of livestock. And that was one of the laws of God. Uh, and this is actually that I believe it is in the Revised Standard Version. Uh, actually translates 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 as, uh, Do not be mismated with unbelievers or something along that lines. Um, which that's a pretty rare translation, but that is one. But also in Deuteronomy 22 verse 10, more specifically the idea of yoking is, You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. And now, in some ways, that might seem like common sense. And I've heard some people say, you know, you don't, you don't plow a field with an ox and a donkey because they aren't suited for one another, and it'll be difficult. But the truth is, there are cultures, from what I've read, in fact, even today, apparently in some Arab cultures, they still do. They will plow with an ox and a donkey. Uh, and it might be difficult. I don't know exactly how they do that. But other nations have done this. And yet, God called them, He commanded that they not do this that they not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. And it, again, it does seem like common sense that you would want animals of the same type, of the same strength, of the same stamina, that can work for the same purpose in this case. Uh, and so Paul calls Christians, he says, do not be unequally yoked together. Now it might help us to remember that as Christians, we are to be yoked to Christ. We are to bear the yoke of Christ. And we cannot bear the yoke of Christ and yet also be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, it's also important to realize here that Paul is not saying, when he talks about being unequally yoked with unbelievers, he is not saying that Christians have no interaction, have nothing to do with the outside world. In fact, he's made that clear in the first letter of the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10, when he was writing about the immoral brother, and he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people, and then he says, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or greedy or swindlers. At the end he says, because then you would need to go out of the world. Paul was saying, you don't practice the same type of judgment. You see, this immoral brother was to be delivered unto Satan. He was to be withdrawn, fellowship was to be withdrawn from him, as we've talked about in times past. But Paul says, you don't take that same stance towards all the sexually immoral and the greedy and the covetous and the idolaters of the world, because then you'll never be able to interact with anyone in the world. You won't be able to influence anyone in the world. So that's not what Paul means. And Paul also uh, shows that he interacted with the world a great deal. In 9 verse 22, he says, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And so Paul, 
as far as it would not violate the law of God, would acquiesce to people's culture. He would uh, try and be amenable to them. Again, he would never violate God's law to win people over. But he would be conscious of the things that they cared about, whether that be Jew or Gentile. And he would do all that he could to have good relationships with people so that he could preach the gospel and so that he could influence them. But he would not yoke himself with unbelievers. There is a very big difference in being associated with people, even in uh, rubbing shoulders with people of the world, being around people of the world, and there's a big difference in trying to influence the world and working together with the world. What Paul is speaking of when he talks about being unequally yoked is he is speaking of close relationships, relationships in which one would truly be yoked to another. That, that idea is used metaphorically throughout the Bible, and it can mean to bear a burden, or it can mean to work in a partnership. So you might think of it in terms of the closest of friendships, business partnerships, of course, the idea of marriage, and perhaps there may be others. Now, that idea of marriage has been hotly debated from this passage. There are those who seem to think that's the only thing, and that's the only thing they really teach from this passage, and then there are others that say that marriage really isn't in, in view here at all, and that the primary point of Paul's argument has to do with idolatry and idolaters. And the primary point of Paul here is, does seem to have to do more with idolatry, but he is clearly talking about relationships that will lead people into idolatry, and that will lead people away from serving God in complete holiness. And I don't think Paul has any specific relationship in mind. I think this is a general prohibition on any relationship we might get ourselves into that would lead us away from God. And as we think about those, again, I mentioned, you know, business partnerships. I think Christians should be careful with who they do business with and how they do business with them, especially if someone is a business owner. You, know, you don't want to get into business with someone who doesn't have the same ethical standards as you do, someone that's okay with cheating on the taxes and not paying people a fair wage and doing all sorts of things that a Christian shouldn't do. Should a Christian yoke themselves together in a business with someone that won't have those values? I think that would be at the very best unwise and might even be wrong. And of course, I do think that marriage falls under this category. After all, what relationship is there that will have a greater impact on us than the relationship of marriage? There is no relationship that yokes us to another person more so than the relationship of marriage. And you can see that throughout the Old Testament. Over and over again, God commanded that the Israelites not marry the sons and the daughters of foreign nations. And when they did, disaster happened because do you know what happened? Almost always it led to idolatry. Now that's the thing. Idolatry is front and center in chapter 6. But one of the reasons God didn't want his people marrying with other people was because of idolatry. In fact, look at this event that takes place in Numbers chapter 25. This is during the wilderness wandering of Israel. And remember, when they came to the land of Moab, there was a king that hired Balaam uh, the prophet, and he wanted him to curse Israel. And he wasn't able to. Every time he tried to curse Israel, he ended up speaking a blessing. And we find out later that he gave some advice to Balak the king, and that was, let the children of Israel curse themselves. He couldn't pronounce a curse. But he said, if you send your women among them, and you entice them, and you seduce them, once they start loving your women, they'll start loving your gods. And once they start loving your gods, they'll be a curse for themselves. And that's exactly what happened. In Numbers chapter 25, it says, When Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And listen to this. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor. Later on, God's going to give a command. He says, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. 
these earthly relationships, when these men were enticed and seduced by the daughters of Moab, and they followed these women, what did they do? They ended up being yoked to the false gods of the women that they followed after. That happens over and over and over again in the Old Testament. In fact, Solomon, the wisest man in all the world, had his heart turned away from God because of what? Because the women he married turned his heart away from the one true God and to the idols that they worshipped. Again, I could get off and teach the whole sermon on this principle right here, but that's not our goal. But I just want to make those couple of comments about this passage. But what I want to look at is these questions, because there's five rhetorical questions. uh, And what Paul does is he shows what is right, he shows what is wrong, and he describes a relationship between them. And this should help us see why any type of close-knit partnership between a believer, a Christian who seeks to do what is right, and an unbeliever who does not seek to do what is right, really makes absolutely no sense. First of all, there's the idea, uh, he says, does righteousness have a partnership with lawlessness? Now, righteousness refers to the one who does what is right. Lawlessness refers to those who do what is wrong. The word there uh, that is translated partnership in the ESV, Lo and I to say it is a relationship involving shared purposes and activity, which by the way, again, what relationship does that describe more than any. Well, I think marriage is one in which it is a relationship involving shared purposes and activity. And so if righteousness is those who do what is right and lawlessness are those who do what is wrong, you might simply phrase this question, how can those who do what is right work together with shared purposes and activity with those who do what is wrong? It's a pretty simple question. How can someone who loves the truth work together with someone who does not love the truth? How can someone who loves righteousness work with someone who loves iniquity? It's not going to work. One or the other is going to give in most circumstances. And that's why the righteous should not yoke themselves with the unrighteous or with unbelievers. The next one we have is light. He says, does light have, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Obviously, light is the right. Darkness is the wrong. What fellowship is there? A fellowship, that word means an association involving close mutual relations and involvement. Very similar word. We talk about fellowship quite frequently, and this is one that's very clear. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Absolutely none. Darkness and light are opposites. Darkness and light don't coexist for a common purpose. You either have light or you have darkness. They don't work together. They can't have fellowships together. There is either one or the other. And I want to read here Ephesians 5 verse 3 through 11. This might help us a little bit. Paul says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, there's idolatry again, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. Listen to this. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Again, that's pretty generic. But Paul's admonition is the same. You don't partner with. Those who are going to suffer the wrath of God because they are the sons of disobedience because they partake in these things. And he says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. If you were darkness, but are now light in the Lord, he says, walk as children of light and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. We have been called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life by the blood of Christ. So how seriously, how serious should we take it when after that we then yoke ourselves to someone who is still a part of that kingdom of darkness and is going to influence us with that kingdom of darkness? That's a very serious thing. Obviously, it is a partnership that should not exist. He says, what accord has Christ with Belial? This is a pretty clear one. Belial is another name in the New Testament and in Jewish culture for Satan. Christ's kingdom is the kingdom of light. Satan's kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. 
and there is absolutely no agreement. That word accord means an agreement or a joint decision. It would be blasphemy to think that the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan, Satan in any form, in any fashion, at any time, and in any way, work in a joint participation or ever have an accord. And that's one of the questions that Paul's asking. So why would an, a believer have partnership with an unbeliever? Why would a citizen of the kingdom of light be yoked together with a citizen in the kingdom of darkness? What portion has a believer with an unbeliever? That word portion means a part, a lot, a share, or an inheritance. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. It says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to the share in the inheritance of the saints of light, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You and I, if we have obeyed the gospel, have been promised an inheritance as saints of light. There's that idea of light again. We've already read what the inheritance for those who are the kingdom of darkness are. They are, they are going to face God's wrath as sons of disobedience. Does the child of light share their inheritance with the child of darkness? Well, of course not. So why would we share our work and our efforts and our energies together in any partnership? And of course, does the temple, what agreement has the temple of, God, of the living God with idols. An agreement is here is an accord, an alliance, a mutual agreement. Does God have any share with idols? Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. God is a jealous God. Not jealous in the way that is sinful, as we are commanded not to be jealous, but He's a jealous God in that there is no other God beside Him, and He will share His glory with none other. And so the temple of God and the temple of idols are mutually exclusive. In fact, in history, by the time, uh, a little bit before Jesus came on the scene, the Jews had learned their lesson of idolatry. Captivity in Babylon had pretty much purified them of the desire to be idolatrous. And sometime, not long before Christ, uh, there was a, an occasion in which Rome was going to set up some idols in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, as you see in the New Testament, the Jews went along with a lot of what Rome did, as long as they didn't touch the temple. And that, had to, that plan by Rome had to be done away with, because the Jewish nation, they didn't care what the response was going to be. They were going to revolt if Rome set up idols in their temple. Rome could worship their pantheon of gods. They weren't putting an idol in the temple of God in Jerusalem. They had learned their lesson. There was no accord to be had between the temple of God and between idols. And today as the church, as Paul has already made clear to the Corinthians, we are the temple of God. And also in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So what partnership do we have with those who are not God's? Hastening on, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. What Paul does here is he actually brings together about five different Old Testament passages in verses 16 through 17. In verse 16, he uses Leviticus 26, verse 11 through 12, and then he quotes a combination of Isaiah 52 and 11 and Ezekiel 20, verse 34, in verse 17, and then an allusion to 2 Samuel 4, 7, 14, and Deuteronomy 32, verse 18 and 19, in verse 18. I won't read these, but these are the passages that are referenced, and you can see how Paul uses them and kind of pulls them together. Leviticus 26 and the Levitical code was a call to the Israelites, calling them away from idolatrous practices and showing them how to separate themselves from the heathen practices so that they could properly worship God. Now, we understand the seriousness of the Levitical code, so we should understand the seriousness of Paul's point. Isaiah 52 deals with carrying the vessels of the Lord out of Babylon and captivity back to Jerusalem and was a call to ritual purity, 
after leaving the pagan land of Babylon. And also Ezekiel 20, if you went and read that, you would see once again as a warning to Israel against idolatry. Now 2 Samuel 7 was a messianic prophecy. And it was fulfilled in Christ. But thus it makes us who follow Christ the sons and daughters of God. And I'll leave it to you to go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 32. But it's a somewhat vague connection. But if you read especially these verses, I think you can see it talks about a God who gave you birth, the rock, which we find in another place in Corinthians is Christ that bore you. So we see the idea of sons and daughters. And then we see uh, the Lord. He said, I will hide my face from them and I will see what there will be for they were a perverse generation Children in whom is no faithfulness, they have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. Again, it's a passage talking about idolatry. So we might not know exactly what the specific situation in Corinth was, but they were hanging on to relationships, or they were forming relationships, maybe with these false apostles, maybe with other people in Corinth, that were leading them down the road of idolatry. Now, we might look at our lives today and say, I don't know of anybody that's trying to get me to worship Zeus. There's not a single person in my life that's trying to get me to bow down to some graven image. No one's trying to take me to a temple to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an altar. So we're, we're good. But we can see that I think we should be able to see that this gives us a principle by which to live by in all forms of life. Anything that draws us away from God is sin. And anything, as we've taught in other sermons before, whenever we let anything take priority in our life over God, that thing becomes an idol, whether that be money, whether that be career, whether that be pleasure, whether that be recreation, whatever it might be. When it comes before God, it is an idol. And as we make partnerships, as we have friendships, as we choose spouses, as we deal with people in the world, we need to be very very careful because the people in the world, even the good people, I realize every one of us in this room has friends, as co-workers, as people in the world that are great people. We say that they're the salt of the earth. We say they're wonderful people. They do all these good things. But if they're not Christians, if they haven't obeyed the gospel of God's dear son, they are not citizens in the kingdom of life. And they can and they will have an influence. Now, I'm not saying we should cut ourselves off from them. I'm not saying we should, stri should not strive to influence them and teach them the truth. But we should be very careful of our interaction with them, our dependence upon them, our partnership with them, our closeness to them, because they will influence us. Whether that be bosses that influence us to skip the Lord's Day assembly so that we can make them more money and get a good promotion whether that be friends that encourage us to do things that are sinful and that be evil, whether that be really good people that are in denominations that try and influence us to leave behind the pattern and the doctrine that we find in the New Testament, or whether that be people that simply pull us away from serving God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. There will be an influence. And we must take that very seriously and we must do what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. He says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness and completion to completion in the fear of God. Since we are the sons and daughters of God, since we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, we should stop living in darkness. And of course, this will impact our relationships and the decisions about who we are yoked to. Remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 33, bad company ruins good morals. We seek holiness and we seek service to God. And if we yoke ourselves to those who are opposed to God, it is going to be all the more difficult to fully apply ourselves to serving and glorifying God in everything that we say and in everything that we do. Lord willing, the next time we'll be able to get through the end of chapter 7. Uh, but I did want to take the time to cover these things because... I think this is important. And again, not just because I think it's important for those who are unmarried to consider when they're considering a spouse, but again, all of us. Uh, again, sometimes that's what this passage gets boiled down to, and then we think the rest of us, as long as we've already made our choice in a, in a spouse, you know, there's really nothing else from this passage for us to learn. 
Uh, but we need to consider very seriously how yoked we are sometimes to the world and how much we let the world influence us. And so I hope that this passage or this sermon tonight and our study has encouraged all of us to do just that. I don't want to end the service without extending the invitation. Perhaps there's someone here who needs to obey the gospel. Perhaps there's someone here who's in the kingdom of darkness and would like to become a citizen in God's kingdom, in Christ's kingdom of light. And you can do that if you'll obey the gospel. If believing in Jesus, you'll repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or perhaps there's one here who uh, is a part of the kingdom of light, but you're living like the world, and you need to change that. And you'd like to confess your sins and have us pray with you and for you. And we'd be happy to do that. So if there be one in need of either case, please come while we stand and while we sing.